Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agassino Zinger, and this is episode number 386. That's Tres Ocho Says with me, your host, Agostino. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? You know, just hanging in there, doing the best that I can. If it's your first time tuning into show via YouTube, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're tuning in via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review, download the show, and share it with all your friends. And of course, if you want to support the show via Patreon, you can down below. There's a pinned comment down below this video. Wherever you're watching this video or listening to this um, podcast, you can find it in the show notes descriptions. Click support. For as $1 per month, you get access to my entire arsenal, my entire archive, my entire collection of audio shows as well as this show in full audio format before it comes out on any other platform so make sure you back me and check me out on patreon what are you delaying with anyway how's it going how are you good great amazing i am pretty well i've had a pretty um heavy training um week as per usual this has been what the first sort of like four week of sober october which has been going pretty well been doing a lot of weight training a lot of well mostly weight training not a lot of running i also i kind of went out my first like you know small two mile run today and i was like god almighty i need to get out here more often number one thing i realized when i was running i was running past a window of some library that i was jogging past and i realized how much of a unit i am now since i've been lifting a bit of weight and not actually shedding some of the excess fat that i have on me i am an absolute unit at the moment so i need to probably drop a couple lbs before the running thing is actually in my destiny but i managed to do two miles today a pretty light two miles just to kind of get the blood running make sure i get my legs moving um and i quickly realized you know my fires you know i put on weight pretty easily just in general and i put on muscle even easier right if i go to a gym for like a couple of weeks and i you know concentrate on just doing curls my arms will balloon and i realized when i put my shorts on today my running shorts they were, you know, my fires are massive now from all the squats I've been doing. So big up starting strength, big up Mark Ripito. You know, that program is flipping solid. I've been doing it for like, what, four weeks and I'm already feeling like an absolute tank. So um, yeah, and now I'm going to be concentrating on dialing down the diet and of course incre increasing on my cardio output. So that's going to require me to have to do three days or maybe four days of running. That might have to include one day of doubles, right? It might have to include maybe on a Monday, I do like a couple of miles on a Monday and then do a big three miles on a Tuesday and then have a break. And then, you know, it might have to do that just because I, it's just, there is no other way to kind of get to the kind of body composition that I want to get to without running. I just can't. But unfortunately, it's legitimately one of the most difficult things to do, especially to start from the base that I'm starting from. I think once you've got a bit of a, you know, you've got a bit of momentum, you've got the cardiovascular base that you need, um, it's pretty easy to sort of lace up your shoes and go out for a run. But when you're a bit big like I am at the moment, you're a bit chunky, let's say, um, you have to obviously lose the pounds to get better at running but you also have to just keep running in order to get better at running so you're in this sort of weird um, um situation where you're having to put your body through a lot more punishment than you would have if you were at the necessary weight that would allow you to run but again who have i got to blame but myself right i could point to covid i could say all that nonsense people are saying oh you got covid pounds like not really you know what i mean i was just being lazy not really being that active but of course you know each month is another chance to kind of start again um rejig some things and this is what i'm doing for this one so that's going to be going pretty well i'm looking i'm actually looking forward to it. i think by the time the end of the month comes up i'll be at a far more i'll be at a far better place you know the places where i'm kind of like you know blowing out my ass i know towards the end of the month i'm going to be sprinting down do you know what i mean so that's going to be cool to see that kind of evolution and to also see my shorts not you know fit so tightly over my over my massive backside and calves in it at the moment my back off is just like bouncing <laughs> whilst i'm running down the street it's an absolute sight to behold me i look like serena williams running down that street at the moment but hey <laughs> it is what it is isn't it <laughs> um, with effort and with dedication and hard work i'll get to where i need to get to that's what's going to happen and i need to actually make a big video I'm going to do it separately. I'm going to make a little video about all the things I'm doing for Sober October. I've got like a list of things, you know, some reading, some watching of movies, um, abstaining from some platforms on social and all that sort of stuff and just trying to um, maintain as a zen sort of um, equilibrium as I can. And so far, so good. I have to say, we're only what I've recorded this I'm not going to take it on record this because that's going to take the fun out of it. But regardless, we're only a short way into October and I'm already feeling much better than I did in the beginning. Anyway, let's not waste any more time. Let's get right on into the show. There's so many things I want to cover, so many things I want to get into. Don't want to take up any more of your time. So as per usual, grab yourself a little drink. I've got myself... Um, I'm not going to say it's the best drink in the world. It's probably full of mad sugar, some sort of juice I bought in the supermarket. But if you've got whatever you've got, grab it, give yourself a nibble, and let's get on into the show. 
so first things first um we've got an update um a pretty boring one for anybody else that's not myself right i'm not somebody that's going to be tuning into any sort of political debate especially a political debate that has nothing to do with myself or nothing to do with the country that i especially live in but i'd imagine a lot of people in the us are probably the same right they're probably like you know what i'm not going to tune into the political debate it's not going to really tell me anything different and i'd imagine probably the uk is maybe similar but i'd imagine in the us people are a lot more fractured than they were prior to trump's presidency or maybe it's even before that maybe it precedes the bush presidency right when um the war in iraq happened probably people started to kind of camp be camped in their own political parties and make up excuses for people during that era i don't know but i don't really see the point of these debates they sort of seem um pointless because you're never it's not like it's not like these debates are ever going to convert a democrat into a conservative or vice versa do you know what i mean essentially you're just preaching to the choir or it's just like you know political theater it doesn't really make any sense but um with that there's an update on that and Tr trump has basically said he's refusing to do a virtual tv event which we already knew i don't think that was much of a surprise um he was really poking fun at biden being locked into locked in his basement not coming outside and doing all those zoom interviews he's not ever going to do that somebody that discharges themselves allegedly from hospital after having COVID isn't necessarily going to be willing to do a, a Zoom interview. But the funny thing about it is that the reason, the rationale why he doesn't want to do the debate is even more hilarious, right? And maybe um, gives credence to the idea that as much of a disaster as he is, and as much as sometimes I can think from the outside, he's sort of the president that Americans deserve, right? In terms of, you know, all the other, especially um, to do with, you know, the Barack Obama era. I think, you know, at the time it was a monumental thing, but looking back at some of the things that he happened under his administration, you know, there were some pretty dubious, scandalous things that happened, but I guess because he's a much more likable character and he acts a bit more presidential, people didn't get onto him a lot more. But I think these sort of statements make me think maybe it is time for just just to, for the americans just to have like a bit of normality and even though you know trump might be i mean so biden might be a bit of an invalid and he might essentially ha over, have to hand over the reins um to kamala harris sometime day later down the line that's everyone keeps saying which is really weird and people keep talking openly about this guy just dying like oh in his sleep one day <laughs> or something or not being uh mentally attuned enough to carry out the duties of the of the uh, what you call it of the presidency that seems very really odd but Considering what Trump said in this article here from the BBC, maybe some bit of normality and just a little bit of boringness, a bit of a return back to normality might be it. But there's also a part of me that thinks, can you actually have four years of Trump and never go back to normality? Can that ever happen? Once those floodgates have been open and once, especially when the Republican side, you'd think a lot of the Republicans seeing how successful Trump has been with a large swaths of the you know American public, there must be a lot of... Um, politicians out there in america who might think you know what i might give this a go i might be a bit of a blowhard right i might say some just like landish things i might just um manipulate and you know toy with the media to my will in order to kind of get my message across because i don't i don't think there's ever gonna i don't think after trump there's ever going to be a republican candidate that's going to be like a shrinking violet you're going to have to be a bit boisterous and you know over the top and all that stuff in it to gain any kind of attention now i don't think you can return to the sort of like you know as it were button down you know sort of by the book politician rhetoric or speak it's not going to work but anyway trump's um statement here is really funny let's read through the article it says here presidential debate trump refuses to take part in virtual tv event and it says here in the article U.S. President Donald Trump has refused to take part in a virtual TV debate with his Democrat rival Joe Biden. Earlier, the commission um, organizing the 15th of October debate in Miami said um, it would have to take place remotely. It made the decision after Trump was treated with COVID. So essentially, it's his fault, right? He got COVID, so they can't do the thing physically because I think, you know, he's a, you know, he's about showing strength and power and authority um and being out front and leading but essentially he let he, he let himself down by getting covid now you can't do the debate in public but it continues he has no current symptoms but the white house is tackling a cluster of positive tests he said the move to virtual was to protect his rival mr biden said mr trump changed his mind every second so obviously they're both um d debating on the accounts but it continued the first presidential debate in the first september had descended into insults and interruptions the vice presidential debate held in wednesday night between mike pence and kamala Hamster was far from measured affair so both the uh, debates have just been super fraught because there's too much at stake now and there's too many people invested um into who's going to be the next president and um, people you know legitimately think trump is a you know existential threat and um, they think that it's going to be the end of democracy as bruce springsteen so much 
obviously said in these other video that I mentioned prior. So there's a lot at stake here. People are really trying to ensure that their person wins. So I'm assuming the people running, the people at the front, the Kamala Harris's, the Mike Pence's, the Don Trump's, the Joe Biden's, they feel that pressure. So once they do get in front of each other for a debate, they're not going to be cordial. They're obviously going to shout over each other. They'll both guilty of it. It wasn't just Trump. Both guys were doing it, right? And naturally as well, um, the, the moderators and the, and the channels too have a lot to blame as well for the affair. They didn't moderate it well. Right, they they wouldn't have an ability to mute the person's microphone or whatever. They essentially let both candidates, you know, ragdoll the entire event. So I could definitely see um, why some people were basically pushing for a virtual event. So just so you can have a little bit more control as to who gets time to speak and whatever it may be. And funnily enough, actually, even if people think Trump will come out worse, I think they both won't look good if they're given time to actually speak on their policies and they're actually given five minutes to flesh out a point or to kind of, um, you know to maybe uh, clarify some things they said in the past. I don't think either are going to come out of it smelling like roses. It continues here. So the US election will be held on 3rd of November. Um, latest opinion polls given Mr. Biden a, a high single digit lead nationally, but the outcome is often decided in battleground states where the states, where the races can be much closer. What did he actually say? His comments during an phone interview uh, with Fox News, with Fox Business Channel on Thursday touched on numerous a number of the key matters, including his health and publicity, sorry, and possibility of movement towards a stimulus package for the economy. But it was his comments on the debate format that drew most attention. So he says the following, Mr. Trump said, I'm not going to waste my time on a personal debate. Sit behind a computer. Ridiculous. They cut you off. I'm not doing a virtual debate. And that's essentially why he doesn't want to do it because he doesn't want to get cut off. He wants the ability to interrupt, to interject and say what he wants because legitimately that's what he's really good at, right? Being off the cuff, isn't it? But given time to sit down, you saw the interview, that went viral on Twitter a few times, a few months ago, or maybe a few weeks ago with um, that journalist, I think that might have been from Australia or New Zealand, who was kind of grilling him on his position on COVID and, you know, um, trying to get him to kind of clarify some of the numbers and statistics he had in a bit of paper. Trump looked really stupid, right? Given time to articulate himself and actually come across as some somewhat um, knowledgeable on what he's talking about, he doesn't have an absolute clue. So, of course, he wouldn't prefer to be sitting somewhere, you know, in the White House with, you know, on a Zoom call debating um, Joe Biden because they'll just turn off his microphone and he knows more likely than not the media whatever platform they're going to be hosted then the debates on they're probably going to favor Joe Biden more so than him so they're going to be prone to kind of cutting him off and you know he probably has a tendency to be a little bit a little bit too heavy-handed and you get the feeling that he legitimately doesn't like Joe Biden either I think that's what's making this thing a little bit more tetchy similar to the Hillary Clinton stuff mm -hmm. he generally got turned off with the Hillary's with the Clinton sorry I'm not sure what happened but he seems to have, have a real axe to grind with them so it's not going to end up well um, he said he also described um, the moderator of the Miami debate political editor of cable uh, news channel C Pan uh, Steve Scully as a never Trumper <laughs> a statement from Trump campaign manager Bill St um, St Steve Pine sorry who had previously tested positive COVID said the decision on the commission to rush Joe Biden's defense was pathetic and Mr. Trump would have positive posted multiple negative tests before the debate. He said Mr. Trump would hold a rally instead which is odd and he said on his health Mr. Trump said I'm back because I'm a perfect physical specimen <laughs> he said that he stopped taking most of the therapeutics but was taking steroids and would be tested for COVID again soon but what a legend isn't it what a legend so maybe maybe he's feeling the pressure maybe he's scared that he might lose i just get the feeling that he just doesn't want to get put in a place where he's not going to be able to do his best he's not gonna be able to put his best foot forward um so why not have it in like a brightly lit studio somewhere where you're kind of shouting over each other but again unfortunately who loses the american public there's that's who loses because at the end of the day you have two pretty terrible candidates to choose from um you know on varying scale scales of the sanity insanity um levels and essentially, you're going to essentially have to choose from one or just abstain to vote. But, you know, with all these celebrities going out, they're telling you to vote. You can't necessarily do that, can you? God almighty, these people. But anyway, let's move on. Next on the list, a pretty sickening story, actually, and something that has been annoying me uh, a little bit, a, well, not a little bit, a lot, actually, <laughs> lately. So I guess you, some of you might be aware that in the UK, we've had this issue with um, students returning back to their campuses or students starting their new term, sorry, especially new students with the September term just gone. Um, 
returning to campus and essentially, you know, uh, turning the entire campuses into petri dishes for COVID. You know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands or hundreds actually of people have been tested positive um, on one campus. I think I remember seeing a story on Manchester where um, the whole campus essentially got tested positive for COVID. And it's been a real big issue, right? Um, and essentially, if you look deeper into it, what basically has happened is that um, the people with the interest, especially in the Tory government, people have interest in the university halls and some of the private accommodation where these students are living were very pushy and put the pressure on some of the MPs in Parliament to obviously open schools and tell the kids to go back to school. You know, virtual learning or learning remotely wasn't necessarily a thing that was spoken about in such a high voice as maybe returning back to schools. Um, they made the reason as to the reason rationale behind that was that oh, to allow people to get back to work, to allow the workforce to continue as normal. Of course, that's again going to benefit the government in some way, shape, or form. You know, the flow of money and all that and essentially now um students are being you know held captive in their own campuses because they're testing positive they have to isolate they can't leave their rooms and the university halls are ill-equipped to service the needs of hundreds of students living inside their rooms and not venturing or going out and doing anything as they please so in some places they're um allowing students to order food from you know delivery and all those kind of places but if you're a student you probably don't have that much money so your parents are either coming down to drop off your some food for you or you can arrange to have to be part of a program where the university puts together a meal pack and they then deliver those to your door that you then pick up at a lot of time. And it seems like from this article here from the BBC, a uni Lancaster University is accused of profiting from food from food deliveries at the university, which is really disgusting and typical of universities, right? They're already charging us, especially when I went to university at the time. Um, you know, well, no, actually before I left, it was actually 10 grand per year. I think when I went, it was about a thousand. It went to about four after the fact. But um university students in, in the UK are paying anywhere between six to ten thousand per year to go to university, right? Just a tuition fee. That's not including the thing, you know, any materials that you need and resources, more that malarkey, school trips, blah de, blah blah blah. That's just just to just to be able to go into the schools. And that's not even including the enrollment fee as well that a lot of um, universities charge too. And most of the time the it's facilities they're using are pretty dilapidated or outdated. So they're already kind of, you know, uh, taking you up the ass for lack of a better term when it comes to your tuition that you're paying especially when you consider your jobs prospects after you graduate the only full benefit I see to go to uni university nowadays is the ability to kind of grow up right the ability to kind of mature the ability to maybe have a better understanding of the job that you're kind of think that you want to do but then when you get to university by doing your coursework maybe do some placements you start to realize exactly what the what the actual job looks like day to day right but most of the um, experience from paying attrition fee comes from hanging out with different people all over the world various different ages all, all walks of life that's where you actually get the value for money but in terms of the actual education itself kaput so to have these universities essentially you know pilfering money out of students at such a at such a difficult time right for such you know basic needs like getting food is just typical 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 so this is from bbc news it says covid19 lancaster university accused of profiting from food deliveries it says the following uh, more than 1000 people have signed a petition again, um, accusing lancaster university of profiting um, from self-isolating students with food deliveries the petition against the extortionate 17.95 a day charge claims the, ingredi the ingredients per portion would cost less than three pounds the opt-in meal being the uh, being offered to about 600 600 students the university said it's kept its prices as low as possible without compromising on quality it said the students were given information on alternatives the food uh, deal includes a cold breakfast a cold lunch and an evening meal to be heated and is being offered to students who self-isolate because of the coronavirus pandemic imagine that you're charging students seven that's basically 20 pound per day that is legitimately insane. Additional hardships. The change that all petition changed uh, started, petition started by um, Kyle Wistrip said, by charging such extortionate prices for supplies, Lancaster University is adding an, or an additional layer of hardship to an already deeply unpleasant situation, of course. No one's expected them to give it away for free, but charging seventeen ninety five is insane. I remember when I was in school, or even that was secondary school, actually, we'd have like a, you know, school, free school meals for obviously disadvantaged kids that I was obviously on, but there was also this thing that they brought in which saved a lot of kids, right? I'm pretty sure a lot of people wouldn't have eaten a meal if they didn't have this thing. So they had this uh, breakfast club that they opened up, right, that allowed kids to come in early in the morning sometimes an hour before your school starts to get a heavily 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 subsidized breakfast that would mean anything between like imagine you get like a box of um sorry a bowl of um a bowl of uh what, what are they called 
a bowl of Frosties or something, right? And you pay like 20 pence, right? And then, you know, and they legitimately will be a bowl, like a massive, massive bowl of Frosties you get for 20 pence. I mean, you could get some toast. I remember it was toast with a cup of tea or something, like just really simple breakfast that you could get, but ridiculously, ridiculously cheap. And sometimes, of course, you know, some kids, I'm sure, didn't have the coins and the and the mums, most of the people that were, the din ladies that work in the mum school were kind of mums in the area, would just, you know, slip them an extra bit of toast, slip them some milk here and there in a really dignified way. But for the most part, especially the times I went there, most of the kids that were eating at that, that breakfast in the morning were the kids that were kind of you know suffering at home had some hardships that they kind of needed that 20p frosties went a real long way in addition to the free school meal they'll get later on in the day it kind of held them through until the following day when they came in school that's why kids especially when i was in school looking back at it why people used to hang around school so much because it was legitimately the only source of joy and fun that they had in their life especially you know when you're going back home and you don't have internet this is prior to smartphones too you have no internet you have no broadband no wi-fi no computer console you're essentially just you know staring into the night or listening to pirate radio so those things in school are really really important and i know how much pressure those little things took off parents as well right the ability to have your give your kid a pound and he could legitimately hold himself for the entire day was sick so to imagine and especially during this era this 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 time that we're going into especially university right very people are from all different levels of the economic scale that are going to uni they're not all rich kids um they're just you know regular kids who are just trying to make um something of them of their, of their lives especially going through such a terrible time you spent imagine you're 18 years old and you spent flipping seven months at home not knowing whether you're going to go to school or not not knowing whether you know, your grades are going to get not, well, no, not knowing whether or not your exams are going to get graded the right way so much uncertainty and then now you're thrown to university was meant to be your safe haven right and then you're being um, essentially um, held over a barrel by a university for two cold meals and a hot dinner that you're meant to warm up yourself like come on he says here changing the unacceptable unacceptability um unacceptably high rates of food delivery will exasperate the health impact of COVID-19 pandemic, making those with symptoms less likely to isolate and most likely to break the rules. Of course, um, a document shared by university shows a set menu, beef casserole dinner, wraps for lunch, of course, pancakes for breakfast. Bank Lancashire University said the price had deliberately been set below restaurant dining prices despite additional cost of delivery and disposable containers. Come on, you can't be, uh, again, Lancaster University, University are fucking shameless. You can't be uh, basing your or a pricing scheme on restaurants right you're not a restaurant bro you're supplying food for um hundreds of thousands of students who have paid you already again this is what you may have to imagine with tuition fees and and fees you've been to pay for the year you pay them in advance you don't start a university you don't even walk into a lecture hall without paying your your bloody um you don't even sorry you don't even walk into the building without paying your your tuition fee it's never ever 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 happens this is flipping horrendous, man. But again, hopefully that gets sorted. But again, no surprise really considering how the universities act here in the UK. They're flipping horrendous. No scruples. No scruples whatsoever. And then we've got like a small update here as well. A small update, a little update, a tiny update, something that we need to think about. So uh, prayers up for um, Chris Christie. I mentioned him in a previous podcast that unfortunately he was one of the um, other members of uh, Trump's harem of confidants that happened to catch COVID-19 at that open air, um, you know, announcement they had for the Supreme Court pick. And he seems to be the one person who probably can't afford to get COVID considering how, you know, how enormous he is and his other pre existing conditions. And I'm just assuming he's probably, you know, not so good um, eating habits or whatever it may be, right? He's probably going to be more susceptible for it. And it looks like that's the case. This is a headline here from NJ.com. It said X. Um, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie remains hospitalized with COVID-19. God damn it, Chris. It says, here, yeah, former New Jersey uh, Chris Christie remains hospitalized, blah, blah, blah. Christie's condition as of Tuesday is not known. Hospital officials declined to comment Tuesday. And imagine, look at the contrast or look at the difference between the way Trump is dealing with it or the way that he, you know, stories looked at about him and what's happening with Chris Christie. With Trump, he was, you know, they were obviously quite secretive in some respects because I guess he's a president. But in most cases, Trump was trying his best to force the narrative. Like, no, I'm okay. This is not a big deal. Um, you know, putting out the, you know, doing the photo shoot, the video of him on the helicopter returning back to the White House balcony. Like, you know, tr just basically trying to make sure that he's the one crafting the narrative. With Chris Christie, you heard he admitted himself into hospital, but have you heard anything since then? Not a word, not a scooby, not a, not an involute dribble, because of course he's somebody that can't afford to get COVID with, you know, again, considering that he's, you know, 
enormous and you know um he's got a history of ill help as well i'm pretty sure he's got asthma or something along those lines it's really ill advised for him to go out without a face mask but again what can you do it continues 58 year old hen um, menhand resident announced saturday morning he tested positive for the coronavirus a day after the president and trump and the first lady melania trump announced that they had tested positive since then more than a dozen of aides and officials in trump's circle put, uh, tested positive as well christie who has struggled with his weight and has a lifelong history of asthma <laughs> tweeted that he checked himself into a up until Saturday, because of a condition, he's at high risk developing of complications and viruses. Like, God damn it, my guy. Um, the governor hasn't shared what his symptoms he has or how he's been treated. He's been uh, he hasn't tweeted since Saturday evening, which is okay. He's okay. He's a, he's allowed to keep keep it secret. But I guess the only thing with this, because I guess some people had a bit of a there was a bit of an existential mm, conundrum that people had to face when Trump got ill, right? Thinking, oh, should I pray that he gets better? Or should I wish that he dies because I think he's a fascist, right? But unfortunately, I don't think Chris Christie is going to be given that sort of um, bligh. Because if I remember correctly, do you remember what he said earlier on? Um, earlier in the year, Chris Christie said the following. Chris Christie said, argued that Americans are going to have to accept coronavirus death to reopen the economy. He was one of those guys. You remember in the beginning, in the early stages, when um, some of the Republican you know, politicians were like, hey, we should go back to live our lives. We're shutting down the economy. Um, especially when the, the the first bits of science that were coming out were like, hey, it's only affecting older people. They were like, hey, you know, they should, they should be willing to, I think, who's the guy? I think it was a Texas guy that said um, they should be willing to sacrifice Older people should be willing to sacrifice themselves for the benefit of the economy, right? Essentially saying your grandma or granddad should, you know, um, sacrifice their lives for the benefit of the stock market, right? Insane thing to say. There might be some truth to it, but were they a bit better? So this is an article here from The People. It says here that Chris Christie argues Americans are going to have to accept coronavirus death to reopen the economy from May 2, 2020. <laughs> so you think a lot of people won't have any sympathy for him knowing that he got it. So let's read what he actually said. Um, as you can see, he's obviously of a large, he's a larger man, so he's going to find it difficult. Ba 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 ba. Chris Christie comment come during an interview with Monday with CNN's chief political correspondent Dana Bash. He said, "Of course, everybody wants to save every life they can, but the question towards that, towards what end? Ultimately, Christie fifty seven said, um, are there are there ways that we can thread the needle here to allow that there are going to be deaths and that there are going to be deaths no matter what?" States around the country are grappling with how quickly to relax the social distancing. These orders have kept businesses shut down and the millions of Americans are out of work. Blah, 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 blah. Um, and he continues here. He said here, da, 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 the economy is devastated equally. Uh, the, 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 the economic devastation is equally sad, he said. Ba, 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 ba. Worse, the other comment said, timid and bold. Christie said governors couldn't be timid and needed boldness in making a decision to let the economies um, resume. But so far, the states have differed in their approaches, with some more quick to reopen than others. He said, in the end, you're going to have to tell them, people, um, you're going to have to tell them, residents, people are going to die and it's going to be awfully sad. <laughs> That's what he said. What those lives are going to be worth if people can't go to work? if they can't support their families if they're going to become homeless and if they have to go to food banks every week to be able to feed their families that's not sustainable either but of course this is he's obviously speaking from a point of some sort of privilege and maybe as well just not no under no, no kind of what do you call it no acknowledgement of his own mortality right which kind of makes me wonder whether or not he actually does one day if he struggles with his weight i don't think he thinks so. i just think he just thinks he's a bigger dude so if that's the case I'm not surprised you'd say something, you know, as as um as uh dumb as what he said here. But Jesus Christ, isn't it? How things turn for you, isn't it? Look at now what's happened. Now he's holed up somewhere in hospital, not wanting to, you know, divulge the details of his conditions. And essentially he looks like he might be in a bad way. So God almighty, man. Pray for that guy, I guess, if you like if if you want to. If you don't, I completely understand. But what a shocking turn of events, isn't it, going forward. Um, next on the list, what do we have here? We have news from summit.news that's speaking about in the UK specifically over 6,000 scientists and doctors sign an anti-lockdown petition. So I guess um, there's been a far more educated, um, I'm happy to say, um, debate around COVID and this response in the UK than it's how I've seen in other places. There's obviously we have that fanatical sort of like, you know, libertarians who are like, hey, let me be free to choose the way I live my life and all that sort of nonsense. But for the most part, most people are saying, hey, we know the economy is going to suffer, but people are going to suffer worse if we keep everything shut down, especially with the government being unreluctant to sort of aid um, some, you know, some sectors of the economy 
um, and by giving them bursaries, by giving them loans, by giving them special dispensation, they're not willing to do to do so. So if that's the case, you're going to have to open up the economy or get things back to some level of normality, and then focus on the people who are at risk. You know, especially people over sixty, maybe pre health with pre existing health conditions, but allow people to kind of resume their way of life in some way, shape, or form before it's too late. And that's basically where the debate has been com- was coming from. So now we have an independent a group of scientists, six over six thousand of them, sign a petition, essentially arguing that the i think it's about the lockdown or i think it's about the curfew um canceling the curfew there's an article here from summit it says over six thousand scientists and dr sandy and talked on petition this is the article it says over six thousand scientists and doctors have signed a petition against coronavirus lockdown measures urging that those not in that risk categories should be able to get on with their lives as normal that lockdown rules in both the uk and us are causing irreparable damage which i think we can all agree on whether or not, I think this is good because it does to acknowledge that the virus is real and that it is actually affecting a huge amount of people. Oh, it's affecting people in really um, uh, brutal ways. Some people like Trump can, you know, skip out of hospital because, you know, they've got some of the best healthcare in the world. But other people are bedridden. Some people have irreparable, um, you know, physiological damage. So we have to recognize that. But also, you know... Um, unfortunately especially with with the way most societies are set up they're not set up for prolonged periods of you know abstinence from work prolonged periods of um the economy being stagnant things need to get back to some level of normality in order for things to continue because guess what the governments are not willing to put their they put their hand in their pockets it is what it is it continues here it says those who have signed include professors from the world's leading universities. Oxford University professor Dr. Sunat Gupta was one of the authors of the open letter that was sent to, with the petition, along with the Harvard University's Dr. Martin uh, Koldroff and Stanford's Dr. J. Bachakar. How have you pronounced that? It says it declares that social distancing and mask mandates are causing damage, physical, and mental health impacts. I'm not sure about that one. Um, the petition, dubbed the Great Barrington Declaration after the town in Massachusetts where it was written, has been signed by close to 54,000 members of the public at time of writing as well as over 2,600 medical and public health scientists and around 3,500 medical experts he's quote it says those who are not vulnerable should immediately be allowed to resume life as normal it notes keeping those lockdown measures in place until a vaccine is available will cause irreparable damage with the unprivileged disproportionately harmed current lockdown policies are producing devastating effects on short and long-term public health the declaration um, also declares it continues the results to name a few include lower child vaccination rates worsening cardiovascular and heart uh, disease um, outcomes fewer cancer screenings and deteriorating mental health leading to a greater excess in mortality in years to come with the working class and younger members of society carrying the heaviest burden keeping students out of school is a grave injustice the declaration adds um, those who are not vulnerable should immediately be allowed to resume life as normal it concludes explaining that the simple hygiene measures such as hand washing staying at home when sick should be practiced by everyone to reduce this to reduce the herd immunity threshold which is definitely something i agree with it would have been nice to have seen more european countries adopt different approaches i think most for the most part everyone sort of done the same thing similar to what i said complaints around the states it would have been a lot more beneficial for us because we would have got different results different findings that we could sort of kind of like you know um take on board and sort of use as an example because at the moment because everyone's doing the same thing all you hear from Tories is oh we're just copying the model from germany france italy right because everyone's essentially doing the same thing but if they kind of did things a bit differently maybe because they just can't afford to there's too many people living in those nations but in general it would have been nice just to have a little bit of a difference so that when you kind of called out the government you could have some example to point to like hey they're doing completely different like why are we doing the thing the same thing that way so that would have been easier to go forward but hey we are where we are. It continues there. It says schools, universities should be open for in-person teaching. Extracurricular activities such as sports should be resumed. Young, low-risk adults should work normally rather than from home. This, I'm, I don't think it's going to change. This, I think it's going to change for forever. I don't think the working from home thing is ever going to, sorry, the working from the office thing is ever going to return to levels that it was prior, um, especially in some of the areas that I've worked in, in London, where all the startups are based, like, you know, the Silicon Roundabout next to Shoreditch, Liverpool Street, uh, and Old Street. That place isn't going to be the same as it was. If you're expecting it to return to its hustling, bustling, um, Wi-Fi-ridden place that it was prior, it's not going to be like that anymore. I think there are some people that have just permanently decided now that they're always going to favor working from home 
and most companies are going to see the cost benefits of not having an office and also the benefits of being able to hire from an international pool of candidates that they're not going to want to just limit themselves to having people sign up for somewhere in Old Tree. It won't make any sense. It continues here. Finally, the declaration demands that normal life should resume, stating that restaurants and other businesses should open arts, music, schools, Sports and other cultural activities should resume. Uh, people who are more at risk may participate if they wish, while society as a whole enjoys the protection conferred upon the vulnerable by those who have built up herd immunity. And I, as mad as that does sound, there is some kind of truth to it because I think it would be a more um, succinct, yeah, a more yeah, a clearer message to send to people. And I think even your most skeptical of you know COVID deniers, anti mask wearers, I think could get behind that. Like if life was allowed to go back to normal into some way, shape or form, but then you were told if you were sick to stay at home, wash your hands, all that good stuff, maybe wear a mask in, um, in you know, in indoor areas, whatever it may be, right? I think that would allow people to have a little bit more of a sense. There'll be, I think there would be an increase in terms of a sense of, a, of, of um, civic duty. I think so, because there'd be something that you could concentrate your efforts towards. Like, hey, we're going to concentrate on people who are at risk, right? Whether it's people that are older, people with pre-existing conditions, it's clear. But when you make it like a huge, these huge generalizations, these huge swaths of people that you're sort of concerned about, you're concerned about saving every single person, which is never going to happen, right? No matter how hard we try, we're not going to save every single person um, from uh, um, not contracting COVID. But if we can focus in, especially on making sure one certain segment of the population doesn't get it, that's probably the best going forward it continues here the declaration echoes president trump's word earlier this week when he returned to the white house asking americans not to live in fear um or let the virus dominate his every day is this summit news some sort of republican website maybe that's why he's quoting trump mad declaration dovetails with other research that was concluded lockdowns will um conservatively destroy at least seven times more lives more years of human life jesus christ than save uh, germany's minister of economic cooperation and development gerd muller has warned that lockdown measures throughout the globe will end up killing more people than a coronavirus itself jesus christos oh yeah we see it before in there but yeah but um um that's actually yeah that's actually a good um thing to see I'm, I'm glad that we're having some interesting um, conversations, intellectual debates regarding the COVID response. And it's not just the uh, anti-maskers and people that are hiding at home who are sort of shouting at each other. It's a little bit more nuanced. It's good to see that from the UK. Bravo to us. Let's move on. What else do we have here? What else do we have here? Oh, that's cool. Let's go for this. Let's go for this one. So, um, I think some people are aware on here that I've got a bit of a penchant. I've got a bit of a liking for the old Nike trainer, um, famously designed by Tinker Hatfield, one of the most uh, legendary sneaker designers that ever existed, responsible for some of my favorite shoes, more importantly, the Jordan 4, right? He goes down in history just for designing that shoe alone. But another one of these shoes that he's kind of been involved in in some way, shape or form was the Air Trainer 1. And especially in this kind of original chlorophyll colorway, one of my favorites, one of my favorites. Um, It's a weird shoe, right? Because it's not necessarily the most, um, sh it's not the shoe that's most coveted by the hype beast or by the resellers, but it does have a lot of love with, with um, avid sneaker heads like myself, I'd say people that are fans of trainers. I won't say I'm a sneaker head, just a disabled fan of trainers, right? And who have kind of a history of buying shoes over the years. We know what the value, we know kind of the beauty of an air trainer one. And for me, actually going forward, um, or kind of, you know, especially in this era, I've seen myself looking at air trainer ones more just as an alternative to wearing like a Nike Metcon when I go to the gym. Because of course, when these shoes were launched in the early eighties, they were kind of essentially kind of spearheading the cross training movement that was happening at the time. The ability to kind of go in the gym and you just weight lift, you just run. Uh, that was sort of like a whole new idea. There wasn't like separate running shoes and stuff. They were sort of trying to meld these sort of ideas into one shoe and it worked really well. And of course this shoe went on to kind of influence other tennis shoes like the, you know, the tech challenge and all these or of other bits and bobs but it was a really really influential shoe and i think nowadays especially that some of the metcons have kind of um gone towards a sort of um non-linear really thin uh fly wire-ish kind of construction i'm not necessarily a fan of those and considering how fat my feet are i kind of need something a little bit um 
uh, a little bit more, a little bit with a little bit more cushioning, something a little bit more prominent around my feet, something that can really hug and grip my feet and sort of ground them when I'm kind of doing my power cleans and my deadlifts and my squats when I'm in the gym. And then I remembered, oh yeah, do you remember all those old school um, magazine scans from Japan or magazine scams from, you know, magazine scams, magazine scans of Nike shoes and back in the day, you'd see these really amazing adverts of people in the gym lifting weights, playing basketball, they'd be wearing these sort of cross training shoes and reminding me of kind of trying to go back to that sort of period instead of accepting the inevitability of gym out attire at the moment which is like really thin trainers and really skin tight um clothing like the stuff that gym shark do right that's really kind of skin tight and kind of grips around your biceps and stuff i kind of want to return to the old school way where you'd wear like a sweatshirt you know and you cut off the sleeves you turn it into a t-shirt sort of thing maybe cut the bit here in the middle some big jersey trousers some big kind of jersey shorts or maybe some swim trunks that you'd wear sometimes depending if you're running but a bit more of a looser athletic colligate sort of feel right um something that you might see a kid wearing you know in some of the pictures on blue eye is it ivy yeah ivy you remember that um get ivy that might that kind of massive book where it's sort of like this um, amazing Japanese photographer went to all these Ivy League colleges and took pictures of everyone's stylish looks back in, I don't know, let's say the 60s, 70s. Maybe that's kind of look that I'm thinking of going for. And luckily, Nike decided to re... Um, uh to retro re retro do you go re retro or to bring back the air trainer one coil fill for an SB interesting update so i guess Nike SB have got this new orange well, they've got this new orange tab thing that they're doing now, which I'm guessing they're taking kind of uh, staple pieces from in the Nike archives and giving them a bit of a Nike SB treatment. So I'm interested to see what the updates are on the SB version of this is this, because I'm pretty sure on the normal chlorophylls, it doesn't have this sort of mesh back on the heel. It's usually leather. So that might be a little bit of an update. And maybe the tongue has been fattened up a bit and maybe they've kind of updated the, mids, the, the insole. But for the most part, I wouldn't necessarily think they were the best shoe to skate in. But let's continue this article for Sneaker Freak. It says the following. Um, it can yeah the air trainer one chlorophyll og returns in sb form it says good news everyone the classic air one trainer in his og chlorophyll colorway is returning very very yeah. soon old heads and new jacks will rejoice old heads that's me uh i like for this long overdue retro which was last seen in 2012 yeah true it's been a while isn't it i've, I've been intimately checking on ebay every so often for my pair to come up but again this sim this is a similar to like a mars yard in that it's very popular but it's also gets worn so it's very hard to find your pair brand new um because people wear them they they actually wear them to death and they most of the ones i've seen online were really really worn to you know close to death so it does say a lot about the reception or the kind of you know adoration this shoe gets from some heads um however there is a twist this time we have um, it's been reworked under the sb umbrella as you'll soon find out it's not a bad thing while the a trainer one began life as a cross trainer in 1987 its effective um versatility was soon proven um when um hot shot john mackerel wore them and smashed the competition on the tennis court and when the strapping mid court entered the retro cycle in 2000s it eventually became a skate favorite because of its beefy upper and grippy head and grippy tread grippy head grippy head sorry grippy tread so it's no surprise that the chlorophyll um has been reissued as a nike sb trainer the og makeup of the gray and suede with the white leather joined with the chlorophyll green assets makes for a super easy to wear sneaker that will look as good on the grip tape as it does on the pavement also if it's true to spec details like the elasticated tongue gusset oh that's a pretty good idea that makes it really um friendly for skaters and um, firm yet responsive air sole and a four foot strap will please both skaters and sneakers are like yeah that's true I've, I, i'm not too sure about a four foot strap on your skating usually this is the kind of the ollie section or the section that sort of rubs up against a grip tape when you're doing any kind of tricks on your skateboard so i would assume maybe this sort of function wouldn't be the best but then maybe this is sort of used to maybe grip down your foot i know for myself as a, in being you know an, an avid gym goer maybe the ability to sort of have this strap on your forefoot does help to sort of grind your feet you see a lot in weightlifting shoes that might be a thing, but I'm just happy they're back. I don't really care why they brought them back. I'm just happy they're back. So when are they releasing? October 3rd. Um, I've already got a pair. So in case you're wondering, they're on their way. I actually do a review actually when I get them. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Some additional pictures here from Attitude. Like they're just so beautiful, man. Such a classic, classic colorway. Like the color blocking is impeccable. The shape of it is just perfect. And it's just interesting too, because this shoe came out in 1987. And you can honestly say there are many, many shoes out there, especially from designer brands, because they have a tendency to do this, right? Designer fashion brands, 
sometimes get annoying in that respect where they don't necessarily um you know come up with original design to just take from the archives of other brands and sort of like you know mash them together into one thing um case in point the triple s that i have right it's essentially got three soles at the bottom but for the most part you can see how much of a class of design is because you can tell some of the shoes that you see nowadays i've sort of taken elements from the um the nike air trainer one and remember this was made in 1987 so imagine how mad this must have looked at that time when it's come out um so yeah i can't wait to get a hold of that so when that comes in my hands whoosh, again I'm, I'm saying some really suspect things today in this podcast isn't it? when that comes in my hands when i get them in my hands i will definitely let you know and make a video so definitely keep an eye out for that one um i'll try and make it as entertaining as i can because some of the review sneaker people on here are, are garbage mate absolute garbage the same old nonsense standing behind all box so box of shoes like hey guys what's good it's like no nah, i'm not bad at life so i'll try and do it my own way and try and make it as informative as i can but yeah keep an eye out for that really 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 great shoe moving on moving on in another update on shoes we've got another collaboration with cactus plant um, flea market between nike and um, they've been absolutely smashing their collaborations when it comes with nike man done quite a few shoes quite a few bits of apparel in a very short period of time especially considering um how new the brand is i don't think the actual person running the brand she's a young lady um is really new to the industry because you know you don't go um from being a fairly unknown person to suddenly being friends with everybody in la and everybody that is you know anybody within the fashion streetwear hype pc realm without having some connection behind the scenes i'm sure she has everything links but for a new brand to kind of go from zero to whatever they've gone is amazing some might call her a plant <laughs> get that yeah no, that's a bit bad isn't it? but whatever um <laughs> really good stuff and i like these again not my favorite model again i'm a bit i've got a bit of an issue with nike trying to force feed dunks down people's throats for the best part of what two years it feels like every two years they try and just force them back down our throats it feels like they're trying to make them as much of a staple as air force ones they're never going to get to that level i just don't think that's the case i don't know whether or not it's about them not being as comfortable as air force ones whether it's the fact that they don't actually have you know what i was thinking actually maybe it's the fact that nike don't actually have a general a gr version of a plain dunk that you could just buy at jd sports or a foot locker or a foot action wherever you live right or a size do they have one i don't think they do like a general shape quality standard dunk low dunk mid dunk high that you could just purchase you could just go into office and just purchase i don't think that exists if it did exist uh, I, I mean in the essence similar to like what air force one have with the white with the all white lows mids and and all white blacks yeah and blacks as well in that respect isn't it they have those two or those two iterations of shoes that they kind of you know give to most shops so you already know what that looks like you know the form factor you know how it fits they don't change the sizing it's just the same shoe every single year you buy it blindly bang bob's your uncle granny's your aunt and maybe with a dunk the fact that you know it looks a bit odd on the feet it's not the most comfortable of shoes the, the i guess the the higher up you go if it's a premium collaboration they get obviously far better uh, materials and shapes and all that malarkey but just the general you know the gr versions of dunks aren't the best in my opinion but again um i quite like this makeup or this sort of um this iteration here with cactus plant flea market so this is from duh, 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 just fresh kicks says the following and um, ever since the vapor max collaboration which i wasn't really a big fan of the cactus plant flea market has held the hearts of many sneakerheads now they're back in 2020 with two new dunk lows i think this has just come after the fact they had an air force one in that i really like too um the dunk um catching is it's catching on fire this year it's not really it's just nike pushing it really hard i don't think anyone's I've, I've legitimately not seen one person wearing any new dunk that's been out lately i might see no i actually i saw a kid in a pair of the the chunky donkeys but that was you know just one of those kids that wears you know head to toe off white so you know what his vibes all about but i haven't seen anybody wearing regular dunks in my everyday life no exactly like, especially during well, lockdown it's hard to see people but you, de you definitely do catch a vibe of what the trainers people are feeling and I haven't seen one person wearing a pair of new dunks that have been at the moment even online as well Insta. who's the last person that you've seen wearing a pair of dunks that they bought even a vitex who's the last person you've seen wearing vitex do you remember before the vitex come out everyone that got them cd to them was wearing them all over the timeline now where do you see do you see vitex on your timeline anymore there we go um, ever since the vapor max collaboration cactus plant fee markets how does this continue do do? We said already while we don't have a leaked images just yet one pair we come hang out is a pure platinum and pure platinum um the others opts for spiral do, do, do. it continues on more information as of now all we know is that two iterations will be releasing this holiday via select retailers you've got one that's platinum and one that's going to be spiral sage updates it looks like most more influencers are getting early pairs 
um, check out the video here of Venus X picture. Oh, well done for her sharing that um, with a just do it drawstring bag. And that's what you get with these um, in incredible Michael Jackson inspired shoes. They look sensational. Oh, look at the mesh they use too. I don't know what that mesh is called, but it's lovely. It's got like really big holes in it. You find it in, um, I'm going to say, it's not sock dart. What shoe you find that mesh in? It's really, really nice. That lining on the inside. Beautiful. Nice thick laces. It looks like a thick tongue. So it's not an SB, is it? It's just a regular dunk low, according to the label here on the box. But I, lo I love the I love what the tongue looks like. Maybe it's because of the um, diamond tays that are spread across the tongue that's sort of you know making the tongue warp a little bit but i love the shape of the tongue i love the laces very very sort of plain on the upper sorry very plain on the midsole and then you know bedazzled all over on the upper like really really cool i love that and the drawstring bag is incredible as well just do it drawstring bag that's probably worth it enough for the price of admission isn't it but i'm sure this is probably the unfortunately this might be the friends and family version. And what you'll get is just probably get a normal box, I'm assuming, right? And probably not without Sansa drawstring bag. They're, they're not going to be able to. They always say this, right? And I and I kind of repeat it too. They'll be like, oh, they can't produce that many. You know, it's just too expensive. It's like, it's Nike, bruv. They're worth billions. You know what I mean? They could easily produce those and sell them to everybody, but they won't. They'll, they'll send them out to all the influencers. They'll give them to a few select like, retailers who will sell more out of the back door. You'll try and get them on the Nike sneakers app. You'll catch loads of L's and you'll be back there again next time for another shoe that you'll not be able to get. It is what it is. Oh, and look at what it comes with in a box. Um, You've got the, obviously the tab there with the logo. And then you've also got this little um, logo as well from um, Cactus Flea that what is it like a is it gold i'm not sure if it's gold i'm not sure if it's a hang tag that you can hang on the shoe or if it's just something that you can put on something else but i quite like the look of that as well but look at those man it looks amazing you do, do you think they've got like a um because what was the other grade there's tier zero there's a up there's a grade above that where you sometimes from nike get like a wooden box or you get a, your trainers delivered by a fucking helicopter i wonder if they've got a version of this shoe that actually contains real diamonds and will they end up giving that to what dj Khaled or something like that right that would be epic, innit? If they do a shoe like that, like an actual real diamond encrusted one that's, I don't know, worth, you know, half a mil or whatever it may be. Now, Kylie Jenner's got a pair as well. She'd be, yeah, she'd been wearing dunks a lot lately. Uh, you could, you, again, you can tell Nike are trying their best to make this a thing by giving them out to people like her to try and make them a situation. But again, she always looks, maybe it's my opinion, but she always looks a bit weird in trainers. Maybe because we see her so often wearing really slinky dresses and shit and mass and amazing heels or whatever, maybe. But she doesn't look the best in trainers. There's a picture of her I saw recently, a pair of Jordan Freeze. Jordan Freeze never look good on anyone, do they? Unless you're wearing shorts, Jordan Freeze look terrible on everybody. And she's wearing a pair of Jordan Freeze. It just doesn't look comfortable. I even saw in a pair of... Didn't she wear a pair of um, Travis's Dunks, right? And they look really awful on her too. It's all like the shoe was wearing her instead. I don't know. It's hard for girls like her to just look good in trainers. I don't know what it is. You have to be a certain type of girl to drop shoes. But maybe that's what I know. Um, so let's see this video of, of Kylie with these shoes and what they look like. Oh, get rid of this music before I get copyright striked. Oof. They dancing in it. The diamantes and that are dancing. Look incredible, mate. That looks good, isn't it? Oof, that's probably the filter I'm, I'm assuming on the Instagram filter she's using. Sorry, I'll take that back. But they look great. See, look, that's what usually what she has in her wardrobe: a pair of Ricks, some boots and stuff. Like she looks better in this sort of stuff because it obviously accentuates her legs. But when she puts on trainers, it doesn't look the best. But continue here. Thanks to LeBron James and he said Bari. We now have a first look at one of the cats. Okay, they got a pair too. They're really pushing them in it. But yeah, I'm okay. So I guess oh, that would be a, such a letdown. Imagine if this is the tier zero pair, this one with the diamonds, and then the ones that we will probably end up having to fight over on the sneakers app are these two. <laughs> what a drop down! Again, um, on their own, they're pretty cool colorways, right? They kind of remind me of a a kind of Atmos Co.jp um, exclusive. But if you know, considering that you show me this and then you turn up with that, you know, that's a bit of a honey dick. That's a little bit of a honey dick. But again, um, let's see. They're due to come out when? when? What's the date here they've got on them? Ba -ba -ba, scroll up, scroll up, scroll up. They look beautiful, though, isn't it? Scroll up, scroll up. Uh, release date, holiday 2020. So I'm assuming towards the end of the year sometime. Keep an eye out for that. It might help to brighten up your year. But let me know. Are you going to get a pair? Um, will you, will you uh, be uh, putting yourself through the raffle process? Putting yourself through the process where you get a chance to buy a pair of shoes? Would you be doing that? If so, let me know in the comments down below. Okay, moving on in. 
what else do we have here to get over before i leave you because we're already on an hour i don't want to waste too much more of your time Ooh, yeah let's talk about this so um one of my favorite designers demna vasilia presented his new collection for balenciaga in paris via an amazing video one of the best fashion videos or runway show videos i've seen during the season um, just amazing again i've got a bit of a hard on for them now i'm a big fan of him you know of course from the work that he did at vetema that sort of blew up and shook the fashion industry to its core and of course he's now gone on to balenciaga and established himself in a really clear and identifiable way um over there considering the heritage of balenciaga but he's just he's just gone about it in his best way possible and i think i was thinking about it earlier like why do i love what he does so much i might stem from my obviously love affair with techno and the fact that he kind of you know which i guess you know it's a it's an american export you know obviously techno was birthed in detroit but then it was completely changed to some other thing when it comes to europe the aesthetic of obviously living in europe the political social economical landscape of europe and parts of central europe eastern europe um you know western europe it's all it's all kind of melded together and it basically speaks to me more than any other fashion designer out there because it's a particular aesthetic that isn't highfalutin it's not aristocratic it's not bourgeoisie it's really real it's to the streets again at the beginning it was a bit whitewashed don't get me wrong that was a bit of an issue but now it kind of feels like he's really coming to his own and he is perfectly the best representation of what exactly happens on the street on the runway he does it in such a really acute clever way and this is for somebody that i think who looks like he's quite a recluse right he just lives in his home in switzerland um switzerland isn't you know switzerland isn't um like a scene out of flipping lehan or something right it's a fairly nice place right and um, people there earn a pretty good wage i'm not too sure how he has such a good ability to be on the button to kind of catch the cultural zeitgeist and present on the runway in some way shape or form but he always does it i don't know how he does it maybe it's just his genius but he's like similar to Hadi Slimane in that regard where he's able to kind of synthesize the energy of the youth and present it out there on the runway and he did a really really good job with his uh spring 2021 collection here with balenciaga and i'll read a bit of the review here from vogue by sarah mawa who agrees with me about all the good work that she's, he's doing so it says it continues here it says hope it's the last thing to die. That's the Russian saying. That's the smart, the smasheroo of a remark. Demna Vasilia threw into a long debrief about how he got himself into making of the Balenciaga collection and video, which aired on the Paris Fashion Week schedule today. He said, you know, I couldn't wait not to do a show. It didn't feel right with the way things are. So we made a music video, he said, which is exactly what it is. It's brilliant. The soundtrack is, I want to see, I should have been dancing when I was watching it live streaming. He continues here. My husband recorded that 80s track, Corey Hart, I want to wear sunglasses at night because, you know, there is any is there anything more absurd in fashion than that it's so allegorical you know there's fashion going on it's out there searching in the dark at the moment not seeing perfect encapsulation of a of a, of a collection right perfect perfect encapsulation of a, of a collection but he continues but wait there's nothing disturbing about this video au contraire vasilia's tribe of them and nighttime people are each captured as if heading somewhere with a purposeful step we see them as they walk along the rue de rivoli um is that rivoli uh past the tulere gardens i'm um, embodying exactly the inevitable core of the type of people who turn heads after dark on the streets of paris we clock them we check them out their clothes how they put them on together each to their own they feel real a, a visceral vi vi vicarious vision of the modern glamour playing out against the backdrop of paris we all love to be part of again yeah and that was honestly one of the things that i kind of um i had to sort of admit to myself i remember when i was on the outside right, of the fashion world sort of like you know mindlessly just like saying oh that's that's overrated she's not good that's crap all this sort of stuff on the outside when i finally got the chance to go to fashion week in paris especially for men's when i got a chance to see i don't know it might have been the second uh off-white show right i don't know what it, which one it was men's show back in the day it was the one where ian connor ran down the runway with virgil and kind of pulled him down the runway right so whatever that show was i remember going there and being around all the street style people being around the industry seeing all that buzz outside of a show going into it the energy the music the emotion the textures the sound seeing stuff move because that's the first time i saw stuff move right because seeing it on video on youtube is one thing but actually seeing it in real life you get a better appreciation for what the designer is trying to do what story they're trying to tell and just what you like right you just you end up liking other things that you wouldn't have liked if you just saw it on a 2d image on your computer so 
that's one thing I definitely realized. It's like, wow, this place is flipping cool, isn't it? Again, it's not the best place to go. It's not like a Berlin where you can just turn up and sort of find the fun. You have to be plugged in when you go to Paris, unfortunately, which I had the fortunate uh, possibility of doing so because of my work. But I did enjoy it more than any time that I enjoyed it because I got a chance to see how the other side lived. I was like, whoa, it's what people get up to when they go to Fashion Week. No wonder people come here all the time. No wonder people are like, you know, planning all year about what outfit they're going to wear. No wonder they sort of, you know, eat nothing but carrots and bloody celery sticks for the next six months because they want to fit into certain garments. Like, this is sensational. And he has a really good way of sort of like, um, representing that in a really real way without it seem a little bit too bourgeoisie a little bit too you know nose up their ass or whatever it just seems like real right it seems like the actual people that you'd want to meet when you go out to paris like similar to like you know the people that go to that possession techno party um that they throw in the outskirts of paris so it continues something happened to vasily during lockdown the very man who plunged his fashion show audience into a terrifyingly apocalyptic show experience last season um has come back with his head a far more optimistic place he said because someday we will be out of this he imagined a man who leaves the house near the site of the Cristobal mansion a black guy sitting out in an oversized navy suit wraparound shades and what looks like to be a sweater dripped over his head which is awesome another addition I'll show you later but it is a ready-made Balenciaga sex story that's going to be really that's going to be really popular too so definitely uh, keep an eye out for loads of your favorite k-pop stars and other stars and other industries deciding to wear that accessory it's going to be really cool it's sort of like a you know the you know when you go out and it's raining and you got to jump and you put it over your head you sort of turn that into an actual hat accessory I don't know if it's got like a little hat you put on there whatever it may be it looks really cool so Gavas uh, related, he said he walked through the night going through lots of changes, morphing into he, her, him, them, and they end up meeting as friends, going to a party or a club maybe, and everyone is without marks. That's the hope. And that's what I got from it too when I watched it because towards the end you see them all meet up and stuff, right? And you're like, bloody hell, man. Like, that's what you miss. Forget all the parties, forget all the amazing, you know, things that I was doing prior to lockdown. But I remember today thinking about, you know, going to open galleries and going to uh viewings going to conferences uh going to lectures uh you know open workshops hanging out with friends in the street and just gallivanting around being lads that's what i miss and that's what you kind of see from the collection that Blenciaga presented so let's go through a bit of the shows here so let's not make it too boring and read all the text so this is the first look again with the the the, the sort of jumper over the head um, I'm not too sure how that clips on whether or not it's a hat that you actually put on itself but I love it what a great accessory to use and knowing them that it probably might be a jumper too that you actually wear you know it might have a multi uh, functionality attached to it um, I love 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 this overcoat but um, Demna knows how to make a good overcoat that's one thing you're definitely going to get from him good um, long uh, drapey overcoats I love this sort of you know distressed um, bits at the bottom here um, you know this idea that you I think he says further on in the article like this idea that you can have these items for a long time or that I think he was saying about he's got a hoodie that he's kept for like for 15 years so maybe that's the inspiration there you've got this amazing detail too with the sort of roll neck turtleneck that you can wear as a face mask I think um was it was it um fashion over or a pretty little thing they made a dress recently that sold out in minutes a sort of like short dress that you could basically pop over your face to put the face mask on um this outfit is incredible great heels of course i love the choke on that one again raw hems on the bottom of the trousers there and the shirt you've got the phone cases that they do really well with the all white look again is stupendous the tracksuit look here is great i'd wear the fuck out of this this is the artist woman right yeah um really really great i love the shades as well brilliant looking shade but that tracksuit is incredible um i'd wear the fuck out of that i love that as well oh, that cape is it like what is it like a cape it reminds me of what some or something um i don't know what the, yeah it reminds me like of, a, of an anorak i guess but it's extended right and, and an oversized anorak that looks incredible that's really really cool and again you've got this amazing um functional shirt as well that you can wrap around your waist You've got this amazing red look that looked really good actually moving in the video. And again, all these items, all these looks look way better in the actual video itself, right? That they put together for the collection. Um, again, the sandals look incredible. Good dress here. Zoom out a little bit. Great overcoat as well. Jacket. And they always, always do a good jacket. And then I think, what's the other pieces I think I liked here? There was a, oh yeah, this one. This is the one. This is incredible. So you've got this sort of uh, deconstructed 
oh sorry reconstructed um what would you call it it reminds me of uh, there was like a fear of god jacket they did a few seasons back that was in, that was kind of all denim that went past your knees and it had this look it's kind of like an uh, it's kind of like an oversized or yeah an oversized denim jacket in some way shape or form that might be it as well i love the addition of the camo in between here and a little bit of black detail here at the bottom as well great 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 jackets and i always like the fact that all the, most of them because i've got a couple british Isle jackets they always have big pockets I'm not sure if it's the fact that you can, similar to Rick Owens, where you can like slip in a sandwich and a book, whatever it may be. But I love the idea that you can have these big warm pockets that you can put your hands in. Awesome. Again, great bags and accessories there. Great overcoat. This leather jacket is insane. I can't even start on the details. Absolutely insane. They flipped it inside out, outside in, upside down. Looks incredible. Again, a good coat here. Good overcoats again great jean jackets just brilliant 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 items from them going forward in this collection and then we've got some of my key detail pieces i'm going to mention here moving on quickly let's go there you actually see some of the bits better in actual on these instagram stories via the instagram right we've been saying see go instagram officially there's better deeds see how how, how much better this stuff looks you know in context like you know you see someone wearing that outfit in streets of paris you would definitely be turning your head thinking fuck what's that Looks so, so good, man. And I think there's a pair of sandals here I wanted to show you quickly. I think that obviously the trainers look really cool. I'll show you those in a minute. But there's a pair of sand in, what was it? Da, 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 I haven't showed them. No, it wasn't on here, was it? Was it there? Yeah, look how good the trainers look. This is a new runner that's obviously going to take over the street. So definitely be, um, be willing to see those out everywhere. They've sort of got like a weird spring system in the back here. I think well, I'll show you on this other Instagram here from the Basilia daily page that I recommend that you follow. This is a bit of the music video. Looks so good, man. show you that let's show you the trainers there we go there it is here duh, 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 duh. but see the daily those are the shoes look how great these look they look incredible and blends yoga x pandas are shaping up to be the sneakers of the season they are in it right x pandas they the conceptual sneakers with norm core ascents inspired by running shoes are embellished with a surprising suspended heel to ensure optimal comfort and cushioning already a collector's item Look at those. At each show, for Balenciaga Yoga, Demna creates the new It sneaker at all its fans for spring, summer. This is the one. Yeah, that is amazing. I'm all over that one, innit? That's probably the best thing they've done since the Triple S, I think. That it looks great. Um, of course, I think it just, I, I think the spring is a little bit, you know, unnecessary because I'm sure once you actually put your foot in it, you you know, the, the, the heel just returns back to normal. So it's sort of like, you know, has whatever shape it's got there, but they look great, don't they? I wonder what the pricing will be like. They look amazing. I can't wait to see what the other colorways of those look. But yeah, one of my favorite collections going forward, man. Honestly, um, easily, easily one of my favorite collections for my best for one. I think one of the best designers out there on the scene at the moment, Demna Basilia for Balenciaga. Take it, Balenciaga. Sorry, Balenciaga. Check it out. Don't be stingy. Spend some money with him. And even these shoes too. Like these are great, innit? it? These sort of like, well, what do they? They remind you of what? Um, these sort of polygon shaped booties are so good great pants as well great shape he does that often too and I, I love the fact that he, he refuses to do like cuffed bottoms on his jersey bottoms that's one of my pet peeves most companies have these sort of bottoms and they always kind of cuff them at the bottom or something or and unnecessary zip but he just has them you know draped down at the bottom really easy really comfortable to wear i love them love every bit of it and of course great casting like look at that colorway and those trainers with the with the black and yellow they look awesome in it. You can't tell me that doesn't look good. That looks brilliant. So, so, so good. I can't wait to see more of this in stores when they're out. And of course, he's got the jumper over the head. Again, I'm not just sure if it clips on or stuff. Or if it's something that you actually wrap around your head. How it sits on your head properly. But I love it. I love that little detail. I can't wait to see um, people wearing that in the scene when it comes out um, next season. 
But yeah, that's been an hour of the Excellent Zinger Show. Thank you so much for tuning in as per usual. Well, if it's your first time tuning into the show, please make sure you smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. And if you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review, download the show and share it with your friends. And I'll be seeing you guys again, another episode of the show tomorrow. So take care, be safe, and I'll see you guys soon.